All right, big distribution. Uh, how do you determine heat capacity? Well, heat capacity is just this capital C. So it depends on K Boltzmann, which is a constant, one half, which is a constant, N, the number of atoms, which is 36 in those two cases, so that's a constant, times the number of modes per molecule. <coughs> In this case, they're just a t monatomic solid. So how many modes does one atom in the solid have in the upper solid? How many ways can it vibrate? How many kinetic energies? One atom there. What, what ways? It lives in a three-dimensional world. How many kinetic energies? Well, it's a two-dimensional array, but it lives in, okay, whether, you, whether we call it a two-dimensional, okay, I, I didn't mean for this to be a two-dimensional world, but just a two-dimensional array of atoms. But either way, if you wanted to call it a two-dimensional world, then how many ways, how many kinetic energies does one atom have? <coughs> if it's a two-dimensional world, two. How many potential energies does it have? Two. two. Did your answer depend on whether I was in the top one or the bottom one? No, it did not. Either in the top or the bottom, doesn't matter how strong the bonds are, because of the world that they live in, they have the same number of kinetic energy modes and the same number of potential energy modes, and it doesn't depend on the strength of the bonds. Now, that was hidden back here. It was hidden back right here. Solid sodium, specific heat per atom just was three because there's six modes and three times a half is, oh this is divided by KB, three times a half is, sorry, six times a half is three. Sodium has weak bonds. Sodium melts right around, a little above room temperature. Maybe 100 degrees, I can't remember where it melts. Not very high. So, so sodium melts at maybe four or 500 C. It's probably boiling, uh, let me make a guess, six or 700 C uh, Kelvin. Probably six or 700 Kelvin or 800 Kelvin. Sodium is probably boiling, you can vaporize it. It doesn't have very strong bonds. How about tungsten? Tungsten is what you use in filaments in incandescent lights. You can get that stuff glowing bright white hot and it's still a little solid wire. Really strong bonds. But the molar specific heat or the or the the yeah, molar specific heat exactly the same because it's the same number of ways of putting energy in. The strength of the bond does not matter. Any questions about that one? The strength of the bond, very important for bond energies. And essentially irrelevant for thermal energies. Yeah? How come the number of nearest neighbors doesn't have a play? However, so, so one has six atoms around it and one has four. <laughs> However many there are around it, each of them can still only move in a three-dimensional world, or two-dimensional if that's what you wanted to think of it. It can be trapped by, by how would you trap one atom in a two-dimensional world? You would have three at, at, at least three atoms around it, probably would trap it in a three-dimensional world. Once it's trapped, it has only three kinds of motion. When you heat it up, it will move, its energies will, there'll be three independent kinetic energies. No matter how many bonds there are, there still, it still lives in a three-dimensional world, so there's only three independent kinetic energy terms. All vibrational. It's the world it lives in. It can only move in three ways. Whether you trap it firmly or whether you trap it with 50,000 different atoms all wrapped around it and all holding it in place. One, however you've trapped it, it can still only do those three things. No matter what surrounds it. So it doesn't matter how many surround it. 
for thermal energy for a number of modes certainly matters for how strongly it, or for how much energy it matters for bond energies it matters for how much energy you have to add to break it all apart because if there's more in your neighbors then there's more bonds but then you know suddenly the strength of each bond also counts <coughs> these are different kinds of atoms any other questions on that one um, how do we know when to include the potential energy modes? How do you know whether to include the potential energy modes? Yeah. You include a vibrational potential energy mode for every vibrational kinetic energy mode. Because if, a, if this thing is vibrating back and forth, then there is a potential energy that's going up and down because of that. And if it's vibrating this way, then there's a potential energy that's going up and down because of that. What if it's a gas? Pardon me? What if it's a gas? If it's a gas, like a diatomic gas, then one of the modes is a vibrational mode, kinetic energy mode, for a diatomic gas, for each molecule. And so for one vibrational kinetic energy mode, you get one vibrational potential energy mode. So I would say always, Whenever there's uh, what, what's called a degree of freedom, like the vibration this way, uh, we can go back to the water molecules even. At least I think we can if I have chalk. One of the things they can do is vibrate like that. When you pull them away from equilibrium, there's a potential energy that goes up. When they come back to equilibrium, the potential energy goes back down. And when they get squeezed together so this angle gets too small, the potential energy goes back up again. So even with that angle, even with that vibration right there, there's kinetic energy is the motion of those things. And the potential energy goes up and down because there's an equilibrium bond angle. And, and to push it away from that equilibrium takes, ener takes potential energy. That's not the case for a monatomic though, right? For a monatomic, there's no bond, mm -hmm. and so there's no vibration, and so there's no, for a monatomic gas. Monatomic solids, of course, are bonded together, so, so there are vibrations there. But yeah, a monatomic gas, when, when there's no bonds, there's no vibration, and there's no potential, bonds come from potential energy terms, and so they have that result, is that thermal energy when there are bonds is going to involve potential energies and kinetic energies. Yeah? So for a monatomic solid, we include the three potential energies, right? Because it's vibrating within... Yes. So the question is for a monatomic solid, we would include the three potential energies, and I will say yes. There's three, here's a monatomic solid, well here's another one, iron. Iron is a monatomic solid. There's three potential energies and three kinetic energies for each atom. So six modes total, six modes divided by two is three, and I divide that by R to get the molar specific heat per R, and I get three. So yeah, for the monatomic solids, you have three ways it can, it can oscillate, so three kinetic energies. Because there's three vibrational kinetic energies, there are three vibrational potential energies. They, all, they come hand in hand all the time. Yeah? How are we supposed to know uh, or assume when the modes are actually frozen? Uh, that, uh, again, I would leave that to 7C to, do act, to, tr to think about actual calculations. And let me just say, I will tell you on quizzes whether modes are frozen or whether we're to assume that we're at a high enough temperature that they're all unfrozen. So, so this is, yeah, this is not something you can assume. Everything, all gases, all oscillatory modes freeze out slowly and at very different temperatures. At, at the room temperature we live in, H2, hydrogen 2, has no oscillatory modes left. But, um, what can I think of that's a 2? I'm trying to think of something heavy. Uh, I can't think of anything. 
O2. O2 has a little bit of oscillatory mode left probably at room temperature. And, and H2 certainly does not. So they, they all, they, all, every gas, is, the modes are going to freeze out at different temperatures. CH4 has some of its modes frozen out at room temperature and some of them oscillatory modes still active. And, and you can't know that without knowing a whole lot more about the molecule and about how, the mole, how modes freeze out. So I'll tell you. Suppose I contain nitrogen gas inside a cylinder with a piston that has a heavy mass on top of it. But this, so here's the picture at the top. But this cylinder is locked into place. So the mass uh, sitting on top of it is not the thing that's holding it. I've got, I don't know, screws in the side or something that are holding this thing, holding this thing down. This piston down and it's holding a gas inside there. Uh, what if I, un suppose I unlock that piston. What, I'm going to tell you what happens. It turns out I unlock the piston and it shoots up to there. So clearly there was a kind of high pressure of gas and it pushes the, pushes the mass upward until the mass is pushing down just as hard as the, as the, this mass is pushing down just as hard as the gas is pushing up and then it stops going up. So my question for you is, so this is a little like a question I asked you earlier, well, except it's a different situation, but what energy decreased, oh wow, I didn't change it enough, what energy decreased after I released the piston, so I wrote that wrong, uh, in fact cut and paste didn't work for me, what energy decreased after I released the piston, so after I released the piston, the this mass went, got raised up in the air by the gas. So you can think about what energy increased, you can think about what energy decreased. I'm asking you for the energy that decreased. 